So thanks again, everybody, for, for coming today uh, to join us for the, this webinar, uh, talking about you know, how we get uh, more firefighters more active more often. So before we jump into the webinar, I'm just going to have our team uh, introduce themselves. You guys know who is on, um, on the panel here on our side. So uh, Jason, do you mind kicking it off for everybody? Yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, hey, hey, everybody. Jason Atkin. I'm with the IFF Health and Safety Department, uh, IFF headquarters in D.C. Um, I've been with the IFF since uh, 2007 and uh, primarily been the uh, program coordinator here for the Pure Fitness Trainer Program and now the Fit, uh, Fit to Thrive Program. Um, uh, thank you to, to Dave and his team at Performance Redefined for uh, um, being uh, part of our team on the Fit to Thrive program, and and thanks to uh, all the other instructors here, you'll you'll meet today as well. Um, we're really looking forward to uh, providing uh, more information resources for you all, and uh, excited to to get going on all this. Um, thanks and enjoy. Great, thanks, Jason. Uh, Garrett. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Garrett Kim. I'm a captain in the Hawaii Fire Department. So that means it's six o'clock in the morning for me, for you uh, East Coast guys. Anyway, uh, I've been in the fire service for 23 years, a uh, peer finish trainer for going on 20 now, and an instructor since 2012. And my background is in biology, athletic training, and coaching. And um, for, th for those of you like myself who, who constantly wanna learn and, and keep themselves on the forefront of, of what's going on in uh, fitness training. This program is for you. I've learned so much, even though I came from a really strong background, um, this program will keep you informed with the latest science and resources. So I'm um, glad to see you guys all here. Thanks, Garrett, appreciate it. Uh, Dave. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dave Samizian. I'm uh, with Dearborn Heights Fire, local 1355. I've been there going on 17 years. Um, I've been with the F2T team just over two years, so I'm one of the newer instructors, and uh, we're excited with the way things are going with these uh, with these webinars. These are something new, so we're excited to see uh, how this F2T program expands, and I think we can have anything that you guys are looking for, and we're always here to help, so just reach out to us. We're, we're always available, and uh, thanks for logging in and being a part of it. Thanks, Dave. Uh, I'm not sure if they're able to speak, but we've got two of our instructors actually at FDIC right now in Indianapolis, uh, Mike and Luke. Um, so, got gentlemen, I don't know if you can you can say uh, just hello to everybody or if you're able to. Yeah, we'll give it a shot. How's the audio? It's good. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So we are at FDIC. Uh, I'm Mike Phillips. I'm from Local 416 in Indianapolis. This better looking guy next to me is. Uh... I'm Luke uh, from Waterloo, Ontario. Local 791. So, yep, we're here just to kind of sit in on the webinar. Obviously, we are at FDIC here in Indianapolis today. Um, so, it is in between classes. We'll just get you here. We got people walking the halls, and we are here at the booth. So, Fit to Thrive will be set up here. We're actually answering questions. We have a computer set up where we can do FAQs, and we're even onboarding some people that are kind of coming in and asking questions as well. So, we are set up here. We'll be here today, Friday and Saturday for anybody that's in this local area and want to come by and check it out here at FDIC. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Luke. Thank you. And Harrison. Thanks, Dave. Um, my name is Harrison Beathworth. I'm from uh, Richmond Hill, Ontario, Canada, just a little bit north of Toronto. Um, my background is in strength, condition, strength and conditioning kinesiology. That's where I did my education at university, uh, played some competitive sports. Um, I've been working with, uh, previously, I worked with athletes as a strength coach. Um, recently, I've shifted over. Um, now I'm working with the fire service with the Fit to Thrive program. Um, excited to work with everyone here. Um, excited to learn more, just like Garrett said. Um, one thing I will just highlight to everyone here, uh, there is a, you, a bunch of you already put your names in the chat. If you have questions, there is a question and answer option as well. If you put your questions in there, myself um, or Dave or someone else will address them, um, either written or we'll address them verbally near the end. Thanks, guys. That's great. So just one other, uh, I guess, logistical thing. Um, so you won't have access to audio or video during the webinar here. Um, so it's only as panelists that will be on video or, or have audio. So if you do have questions, um, as Harrison mentioned, just put them in the chat and either we'll get to them right away uh, during the webinar or we'll 
we'll have uh, some time after at the end to answer anything you guys might have. Okay, so my name is Dave Frost. I am um, a professor at the University of Toronto in Canada and have been working with the IFF very closely with Wellness and Fitness, their Wellness and Fitness Initiative, Pure Fitness Trainer Program, and now Fit to Thrive since about 2009. Um, love it. Uh, you know, everything that we're doing, everything, you know, all the feedback, the opportunities to interact with uh, individuals like yourselves. Uh, with this pursuit of trying to help firefighters become more active, uh, healthier individuals, both for, for the job and, and for life in general. So today, what we would like to do is share some thoughts with you on this pursuit of more firefighters, more active, more often. As we transition from the former Peer Fitness Trainer Program to Fit to Thrive, we've really embraced this new mission of, you know, how do we get more firefighters, more active. Um, so with, with that said, uh, I'm gonna share my screen here and uh, we'll, we'll jump into the, the presentation. So Harrison, if you could just make sure uh, when I'm sharing here that we're all good to go. Just switch that over to the, uh, there you go, looks good. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, the uh, Fit to Thrive program, the mission that we have really is more firefighters, more active, more often. And this is a bit of a shift just in the, the perception, I guess, around, um, you know, I guess the, the aims of pure fitness. You know, I think historically there has been a big push for fitness within the fire service. And this is by no means to dismiss the value and importance of, you know, fitness for firefighters. You know, given the demands of the job, you know, fitness is absolutely critical. But when we think about things more broadly and look at, you know, health and wellness and, and everything that we're trying to accomplish with, uh, you know, the wellness and fitness initiative and the impact that I think that we can have on physical, psychological and social well-being, physical activity is such a big part of that. And it isn't just about being fit. Uh, you know, it is really about trying to help people become more active. And it's that pursuit of you know, activity um, that is really gonna help a lot of firefighters out, um, not instead of, but perhaps in addition to uh, the, the outcomes of being you know, some level of physically fit. So today we're gonna talk about different strategies to actually help um, you and your peers within your departments uh, trying to become more active. To, to experience the, the benefits that do exist uh, that go along with you know, physical activity. So knowing that there's a lot of different perspectives out there on, on what physical activity is and, and how it can be used for, this is a quote that really resonates with me. And it may not be exactly the way, the way you think, but I think it sums up the literature at the moment. Um, that exercise really is uh, this amazing tool that we should all be trying to embrace um, to help with longevity, to help with health. Now, knowing this, so just knowing that there's a lot of benefits that tie into physical activity, and I, I would assume that most people on the call right now would, or on the webinar right now would agree that exercise or physical activity is, is a good thing. And if you reflect on the attitudes of your peers, most firefighters would also agree that you know, physical activity an exercise is probably a good thing. But despite knowing these benefits, the reality is that most firefighters aren't getting enough activity. You know, this stat here um, is, is from some work that's done specifically with firefighters. And it's found that only 20% of firefighters are actually meeting the physical activity guidelines that were established by the World Health Organization. And those, those guidelines say that, you know, not, not just firefighters, but people in general should be getting 150 minutes of moderate, vigorous physical activity every week. And so for firefighters, you know, we've never looked at the, the needs from a physical activity perspective for firefighters, but given the demands of the job, I would say at minimum, um, firefighters should be meeting this standard that's been established for the general population. But despite knowing the benefits, um, firefighters aren't active. And this is, this is, I think, the reality that we all need to be thinking about when putting together you know, various wellness 
uh, fitness exercise related initiatives. Um, because, you know, as a, as a, one of the number one priorities, it should try and, it should be trying to get more firefighters active. And as I mentioned, that, that really is one of the big missions that we have with, with Fit to Thrive. So just for some context, um, I thought this was really another really interesting stat. So if you think about smoking, uh, you know, smoking is obviously, it, it's very well established. It's, it, you know, <laughs> it doesn't really do anything good for us. And so with regards to the risk of all cause mortality, someone who smokes in comparison to someone who doesn't smoke has a 40% uh, higher risk of, of dying. Um, so, and, and the same is kind of true for, you know, someone with cardiovascular disease, somebody with diabetes, somebody with uh, hypertension. And so if you have these conditions or you have a history of smoking, you're at higher risk. And I think there's been a lot of, uh, you know, awareness around smoking in particular. Um, so, you know, fewer people smoke today than that have in the past. And so I think we're, we're making some strides with, uh, in regards to that, but really interesting. So just for, again, like for context, when it comes to exercise and activity, the results are even more staggering. So I said 40% increase for history of smoking. But when it comes to activity, if we compare, uh, you know, as a, say as a baseline, someone has below average fitness levels, okay? So this is the person that is probably not meeting the physical activity guidelines, but is, is somewhat active. So below average fitness levels. In comparison to someone who has low, or like the lowest end of uh, the fitness levels, the, there's a 100% increase in all-cause mortality. So just by having below average fitness, there is more of a protective effect than if you don't smoke. That's how powerful exercise can be. And if we extend that out, so not below average fitness, but if we look at you know, the, the individuals, you know, the firefighters at baseline that have above average to high levels of fitness, that risk uh, associated with all cause mortality jumps up to 400% um, in comparison to the person who like, so the sedentary individual. Um, so this really, to me, it highlights how powerful exercise can be. And I don't think that this is, you know, how a lot of, you know, firefighters in particular are thinking about uh, the role that physical activity plays. And so this is not to dismiss the, the importance of not smoking and you know trying to prevent you know cardiovascular disease it's to really highlight the value the physical activity can provide um, and so just by having modest activity levels that perhaps don't even meet the, the physical activity guidelines we're going to see a, a huge reduction in, in all-cause mortality and so again you know it, being inactive comes with an elevated risk of lots of different things um, and so not to say that this is the reason why we should be you know, trying to be active to avoid, you know, all, all this bad stuff, but it's also in pursuit of, of some good things. And so traditionally, when we think about um, exercise and, and, and understanding the benefits, um, we do link it to physical pursuits. And so physical activity, physical pursuits. So yeah, that, that makes kind of sense. But I just wanted to highlight a few things as well that exercise has shown to, to provide benefits with. So in terms of brain health uh, or, or you know, just cognitive functioning, um, there's a lot of work that's been done to highlight that you know, exercise might be one of the best things that we can do, uh, both for mood, for memory, and for learning, um, just to promote you know, new brain cell growth and you know, avoid some of the degeneration that, that you know, occurs with age. Um, exercise and activity can be absolutely phenomenal. And this isn't about having a specific fitness level, but it's the pursuit of being active on a regular basis. There's also work to show that uh, exercise can actually counteract some of the, the grogginess that, that we experience when first waking up. And so if you exercise uh, in the morning or whatever you do happen to get up, uh, it can help to, to counteract that, that inertia that we might feel. And for firefighters in particular, if you're, you know, kind of being woken up at, at periodic times, you know, this a short bout of, of activity right away could help you become more alert um, in a very short period of time. And the evidence actually says that it won't necessarily hurt the sweet sleep quality should you need to go back to bed, you know, shortly after being active. 
Um, so there's a, a, a definitely a, a very important relationship between exercise or activity and sleep as well. With regards to blood sugar levels, so just short walks, of, you know, 10 to 15 minutes uh, right after eating have shown to lower blood sugar levels. If we think about uh, just the aging process in general, and you know, really trying to enjoy the retirement that that everybody has earned, there's evidence to show that being active on a regular basis can actually slow the aging process. And so if we think about, you know, what happens when we're, we're active, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, shift in, in energy towards just the repair of various tissues. And the thought is that, you know, some of that can actually help to slow aging as well. So, you know, being active on a regular basis can extend not only lifespan, but health span and allow us to age uh, a little bit better, you know, so enjoy the retirement that everybody's earned. And maybe the last thing I'll, I'll mention here, our activity habits influence those around us or you know, conversely, the activity, so activity habits of others will influence our activity habits, or especially in the fire service because culture is such a, a big part of this. There's, uh, there's, there's definitely, uh, I guess, a need to just be aware of that fact. And I thought this was an interesting stat as well as, as a, a parent of two young kids, that every 20 minutes that a parent spends being active means five more minutes for their child's activity. And so, you know, the, the habits that we establish have a direct influence on those around us. Um, so this isn't just, you know, about us. There's, there's definitely a, a broader impact that can be had by being active on a regular basis. So all that to say, exercise is good uh, for a variety of reasons. So then I think the question becomes, well, okay, our, what do we do about it? You know, how do we actually help firefighters become more active? And this, this is where it gets a little bit more complex um, because before we decide what needs to be done or what can be done, it's really important to establish well, why are firefighters either active or why are firefighters, uh, firefighters inactive in the first place? So what that means is that we have to understand the behaviors of firefighters before we can actually uh, develop or identify appropriate solutions. So from a behavioral perspective, because really what we're talking about here is, is changing behaviors. We need to take somebody from being inactive to active. That's a shift in behavior. And so the, the, there's been a lot of work done in this area and it's been highlighted that there are three general uh, factors that influence the behaviors that we exhibit. And this isn't just activity. This is, this is any behaviors that you exhibit on a daily basis. So they are influenced by our capabilities. So this can be um, like physical skills that we have or, or uh, psychological, kind of the cognitive, the knowing, the understanding. So capabilities, how much knowledge that we have, the actual abilities that we have, that could influence how active we are. The second factor here is the opportunities. So do we actually have the time? Do we have the space? Do we have the facilities? Do we have access to, to resources that are gonna allow us to be active on a regular basis? In many cases, um, you know, firefighters might be inactive because they just don't have access. And then the other, <clears throat> the second one under opportunity is the, the, I guess the social context. So what is the, the social group that you find yourself in? Do you have peers or family members or friends that are also active um, and, and seeing them be active uh, or seeing them be sedentary, that could be a reason why you've adopted the behaviors you have. And then the last piece is under, falls under motivation. And so this can be things like, uh, you know, self-confidence or the interest in the activities that are being presented to you, or it could be things like establishing a, a routine to make active choices easy. And so if every day is a bit of a struggle and you have different schedules, um, which you know, can be the case for, for firefighters trying to balance everything, but just does your schedule uh, make it challenging to actually fit in you know, regular activity? And so thinking about those six categories, you know, two that fall under capabilities, opportunities, and motivation, uh, if we can understand that, then it's going to help to us to establish well, what is a path forwards to help this individual or this population become more active. Because if we think that just providing education and telling people the benefits of exercise are going to you know, help firefighters become more active, I think we're, 
you know, we're not going to have the success that we were trying to have because educating people um, on the benefits might help if the obstacle or the barrier they currently have is knowledge, but it won't help if it's the, the social environment they find themselves in is just not conducive to being active. And so this is really where we have to marry the, the solutions that we're coming up with to the underlying behaviors, the reasons why firefighters aren't active in the first place. And this is something that Fit to Thrive is really trying to embrace. So uh, regardless of, of where you and your department find themselves, that there are solutions you guys can plug into to address the needs uh, within, your, within your department. And I just wanna highlight uh, you know, one thing as well before we, we get into some examples of this and that in no way are we dismissing the value of physical fitness. Um, so that is, that is definitely an outcome that is, is essential for the job, just to be able to perform, to be safe um, you know, for, for yourself and, and for your peers. But we have to acknowledge that there are many paths to get there. And so what we do today um, is going to influence what happens tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. And there are many uh, departments, many individuals that find themselves in a situation where the, the path forward or the, the next step is not to you know, tell everybody you are really, really fit right now. The next step for, for some departments might be, well, how do we figure out how to establish you know, better routines? You know, and this could be via policies or something that's put in place just to provide more opportunity for people to be active. Ultimately, you know, for the ultimate goal to have them, you know, have the physical abilities to perform the job, but they can't get there, you know, in a week's time. And so we have to take a bit of a longer term perspective to the solutions that we're, we're putting together that, again, are based on the current situation that we find ourselves in. So with regards to, well, what do we do? Uh, there's a lot of different interventions that we can explore. And so these are just, you know, seven examples of things that can be done with regards to change behavior. And so historically, at least based on my experience and speaking with uh, you know, a lot of different departments and just organizations in general, education and, and training, you know, kind of sit at the forefront. And so we're going to tell people of the benefits of exercise and, you know, here's, you know, bad things that will happen, you know, as, as kind of even I did. Um, bad things that will happen if you don't exercise, and here's the good things that will happen when you do. And perhaps we embed some type of training aspect into this to help, you know, give them more skills, more confidence. But there's a whole host of other things that can be done to help people become more active or help people to change behavior in general. And so, you know, we've got a list of seven here. So from an environmental restructuring perspective, this is perhaps we need to do something about the, the physical environment or the social context that people are, are kind of uh, being engaged with. Because, you know, just as an example on the social side, perhaps there are, are triggers or prompts that, that can be um, you know, made on a regular basis just to say, oh yeah, I, I need to, to, to do this at a particular time of the day. Um, just so it's just kind of like a reminder um, that, yeah, I need to, you know, get up for my, my, you know, three minute movement break in the middle of the day. I've been, you know, kind of sitting on the couch for a little bit too long. So there's, you know, some things that we can do from an environmental perspective, obviously education, this is where we're trying to just, you know, increase knowledge or, you know, improve understanding of a particular topic. Um, persuasion, this is where, you know, something else that, you know, we can actually leverage. So if we're trying to induce some type of feeling, whether negative or positive, to initiate or, or trigger some type of action. Um, you know, if you think about uh, how do you, you create some type of emotional response to encourage someone um, to start something. And this may not be the same strategy that's used in the long term, but in the short term, um, you know, persuading people to, to do certain things um, that are going, that we know are gonna have a positive impact on their health can be a, uh, a really great strategy to explore. The next one uh, with incentives. And so there's lots of different ways to incentivize um, activity. And I know, you know, some of the departments on the webinar right now have probably explored this option, anything from, from time to money to some other type of reward. So there, there's lots of ways to incentivize and the actual incentive or the reward that happens on the, the back end should again match 
the interests of the population. So money is not going to be an incentive for everybody. Um, you know, time is not going to be an incentive for everybody, but it might be for some. And so having a variety of incentives in place to, you know, just create this expectation of some type of reward can be, again, something that helps in the beginning. Obviously, if we're trying to create this sustainable, long-lasting uh, program, uh, perhaps the incentives shift or change over time. So it really is the habit that's established that is keeping people there rather than just the, the expectation for reward. But incentives can be a, a big contributor here too. Now, obviously training, you know, this is just, uh, you know, where we're trying to develop skills in, in pursuit of something specific. Um, so with regards to exercise and activity, perhaps this is just helping people understand what could be done in different environments. And so if the association with activity has always been, I got to be in a gym setting and that's what I know. And I don't know what to do at home. Um, perhaps it's, it's helping them you know, see what that looks like and giving them some, you know, very practical things that can be done um, in an environment where they don't have access to the same uh, space and equipment. Uh, and then I guess the sixth one here, so enablement. So this is really trying to enable the behavior that we're, we're targeting. And so perhaps there are barriers or obstacles that are in place that we need to be, that need to be removed. And so within a department context, you could think that um, perhaps just on access to on-duty time to be active, um, not having that is an obstacle to be active on shift. Um, or it's, you know, if, if there's a, a specific time of day that people have to be active and, you know, rarely do we, you know, have access to that time, that could become the obstacle. And so by, you know, trying to think about, you know, just some different creative strategies, how do we reduce that, that obstacle that exists? Uh, so this individual or this group can actually be active. Um, that's another great, um, I guess, type of intervention that, that many organizations have explored. And then the last one, sometimes we just don't know what we don't know. And having an example of what this could actually look like in a department of similar size and you know similar kind of structure, it's like, oh, I, I never really thought of that before. And so one of the things that the IFF is trying to do is establish a series of, of cases or scenarios of, of things that people have tried. So whenever you're thinking about what can be done in my department, that you're not starting from scratch. You know, you can lean on some other examples of things that people have done. And just by having that example that you can try and imitate or try and aspire to, maybe, maybe it's not today, but, but working towards that, it can re really give you a great roadmap. And so now you see what's, what's possible. So those are just some examples of things that can be done uh, to help change behavior. And so we need to be thinking about all these different factors when actually laying out what a, a plan might look like in my department. And just really quickly, um, that's not an exhaustive list. And so just a couple other things you guys might be thinking about, well, yeah, this stuff also matters. So the policies you have in place, you know, do you have, have champions to support a program like this? Are there people of influence that have been involved? Uh, do you have some type of funding? Um, and not to say that you need every one of these, but these are gonna help to support a, a lot of the other stuff that was mentioned. Um, and so if the, with the goal of trying to get more firefighters active, we really need to be thinking about how can we create a, a system to support that? Because just like I said before, just telling people to go be active is not gonna work. Um, or if it works for some in the short term, it definitely is not gonna work in the long term. And we need to think about how do we, we structure a very comprehensive plan that addresses the, the behaviors that we're trying to change. And you know, what's in place to create that shift in behavior might require a bit of a different, um, uh, a different model than trying to sustain a particular behavior. And you know, every department may have some similarities, but there's probably gonna be some, some nuance there as well, where a unique solution you know, might really help. So the, the one thing, uh, I guess, the next thing I'd like to do here is just walk you guys through a few different examples of, you know, things to consider, um, you know, under the umbrella of, of what we just talked about in terms of actually trying to change behaviors with some of these strategies. So first scenario. So the reasons why these firefighters in this department are not active is because they have limited physical ability. 
And so this ties to the capability piece. And so the goal here would be to increase their fitness and physical skills so they can be active in a range of contexts. Okay, so the reason why they're not currently active is lack of lack of fitness or lack of skills. You know, they understand why the benefits are there, they have the opportunity. So the department has has provided you know time to do exercise on, on shift. The culture is supportive of it. Um, there's there's opportunities to actually embed some type of routine here. Uh, the firefighter is interested, they're engaged, but they just they don't feel like they have the abilities to, to do what's needed to be done. Well, in this case, one of the, the, the primary things that can be targeted as an intervention is training. You know, let's create opportunities to actually improve their skills. And this may also involve some type of assessment so they understand where they are and can monitor progress along the way. But you know, one of the, the things I wanted to highlight here, if training is going to be implemented to address that need, is make sure that training reflects the level they're currently at. Because if we look at the demands of the job and say, hey, everybody needs to do this for the job. But right now they've said, hey, the reason why I'm not active at the moment is because I don't have fitness or have skills. They look at what's you know, been put forth in terms of the needs for the job. And it's like, I'm nowhere close to that. So I'm not even gonna start. And they shy away. And so training can be a, a really valuable uh, intervention here, a tool to, to use to help address this need. But again, make sure this is a, a long-term strategy. So let's you know, kind of come in here at the level they're at and slowly improve them over time. And just a couple of thoughts here in terms of how you could support the idea of training, but you could actually use champions or people of influence within the department to help share some of this information or help you know, deliver you know, some of the, the, the activities or, or um, you know, the experiences that you're using to facilitate training. And, you know, from a policy perspective, it's, you know, can we embed these training opportunities within the day-to-day? The -day? And so if you don't have some type of policy in place, so it's like, yep, training is great, uh, but we have no time for it. Well, you know, that you're kind of kicking yourself at the same time. So if you're suggesting that training is going to be important, you know, commit to it and try and have it scheduled on a regular basis so people can actually engage with it. Um, and then, you know, just a couple, uh, you know, little things down here at the, the bottom, uh, you know, as I mentioned, make sure it, it meets their abilities. Um, we can, you know, support each other with groups with different abilities or, or similar abilities. And so if, if you look at, uh, you know, your entire department, well, maybe there's a way to bring people together with similar abilities so they feel a little bit more comfortable in that space. And so the training they're going through, in addition to matching their, their current abilities, they look across the room and they see people in a similar situation and that could help them feel a bit more comfortable in that environment. Second example here. So these firefighters uh, are currently in, inactive because they have limited knowledge or understanding. Okay, so perhaps they have the, you know, some type of physical ability. Um, again, they have the opportunities. There's, there's a level of interest here, but they just don't, quite understand um, either the, the complete benefits or they don't understand what to do. You know, so if we were able to uh, teach them what to do or give them some insight what to do in the space they have access to um, with the time perhaps they, they have access to, then maybe that's gonna allow them to actually be more active than they are right now. And so in this case, education can be uh, a big contributor. But one of the things that we might need to consider on the education front is to highlight the personal value for them. So if, if they don't understand why, um, you know, or the, the value of the information that we're sharing as it relates to, you know, their life, so the constraints they have, then that isn't necessarily gonna have a big impact. And so if, if you know, their, you know, specific situation entails that they don't have more than, than 25 minutes to be active when they're on duty. And you know we're giving them information or educating them on how to, you know, structure these you know 45 minute exercise sessions. Well, this this has no relevance because there's they're you know looking at this and saying I don't have that time. And so it's making sure that the the personal value or you know what we're we're educating them on and the information we're sharing actually aligns with the situation that they find themselves in. And again, planning can help to to support this. You know, we can use training to reinforce this as well. So if we're giving them some type of education, 
or, or information. Let's actually put it into practice. Let's apply it so they see what it looks like rather than just hearing it from us. And just that application of it could help to reinforce it and make it stick. A um, couple other considerations here. So we're trying to make this information and the education accessible through different channels. So not assuming that everybody you know, wants to or can learn by reading something or by watching something, uh, by listening to something. So explore all of the above. And the more accessible you can make things, then the more opportunity that people are going to have to actually plug into it and benefit from it. Um, you know, having opportunities embedded for questions and feedback is also, you know, involving them in the process is going to go a long way to having them engage and, and seeing that personal value. Scenario three. So <clears throat> the situation here is that the firefighters have limited time and or access to space and equipment. Um, so the solution here is not necessarily to change the environment that they find themselves in, because in many cases, that just isn't possible. But it's can we share strategies and tips to make best use of the time and space that you actually have? And so in my experience, you know, a lot of firefighters think they need this much time or think they need this access, like access to these things. And that just isn't the case. And so one of the things that we can actually use to intervene in this case is let's use some type of modeling approach. Let's show them what has been done or is being done <clears throat> elsewhere um, by a group that finds themselves in a similar situation. And so when you actually see what's possible, it's like, oh yeah, I guess, I guess we could do something like that. You know, we had this idea of it had to look a certain way, but now we see another department, another group actually uh, with similar constraints, making a lot of progress, um, you know, that could really help to change the attitude or the perspective of what happens um, in your department. And, you know, again, some things here to help support it, just thinking about how do you structure or restructure the environment so it is suitable or conducive to um, uh, taking advantage of the limited time that you have. Um, you know, are there opportunities to embed uh, activity off shift? You know, it doesn't all have to be done on duty. Like, are there things that can be done at home, um, you know, with your family or with, um, with your friends? Um, and so some of the initiatives that are put forwards might be, well, how do you um, be active with family? And so perhaps, you know, as I mentioned there before with kids, you know, being more active, if you're more active, are there some tips, strategies that you can share on how to be active with kids? And, and maybe that alone gets, you know, more people engaged and, and active, which is ultimately what we're trying to do. So one little, maybe uh, just a consideration here. Um, there are opportunities to embed little movement breaks throughout a day. And so, you know, the, the physical activity guidelines say 150 minutes a week. It doesn't say 150 minutes at a time. It doesn't say 60 minutes at a time. So we can accumulate, you know, five minute little bouts of activity here and there to get the 150. And so just sharing or, or highlighting with people what can be done throughout a day in as little as five minutes can go a long way to highlight what's actually possible. Scenario D, uh, so I'll just kind of quickly get, go through these last three here so we have some, some time for questions at the end. Um, so scenario D is where I have limited support from my peers or the, the people around me. And so in this case, one of the things that we can explore is you know, actually using incentives. You know, can we gamify the activity options to encourage broader participation? And by gamifying something, um, it doesn't have to be uh, just with competition or you know who's the most fit individual. You know there are things that we can do with you know just being active. You know how many times, how many people, and you know were were active for more than five minutes, or how many people went for a walk today for any any length, any distance. And when you start to gamify things, it could encourage broader communicate, uh, broader uh, um, uh, involvement. And so now the people that are not have not been historically active and the people that are very active have a common goal uh, that can be shared. So maybe it doesn't matter what type of activity you do, but everybody can plug into the same thing. Um, and so there's, there's lots of opportunities there to explore, uh, you know, to create a bit of a different support system or change that culture around, um, around activity. And again, you know, using, you know, thinking about the environment, how it's structured, using the champions, 
um, to really influence those behaviors can be a big, uh, a big win in, in this case. So for firefighters who have limited self-confidence and they don't perhaps have the interest in being active, at least in the way that it's been, been sold. Like I don't have interest in going into a gym and exercise, but it doesn't mean that I don't like to be active. You know, when I'm on my, when I'm at home, I like to go hiking and I like to go for walks and you know, ride my bike and, and do all these things because I see the value of being active. So in this case, maybe it is just changing perceptions of what physical activity is and, and what it can look like and celebrating some of the small wins. So people that don't have a whole lot of confidence uh, in their pursuit of being active, this really is looking at, can you uh, celebrate some of the small steps that are being made? So this doesn't have to tie to a fitness outcome. It can tie to, you know, were you active three days this week? And by active, it means, did you do something for more than five minutes or like five minutes? And so three, five minute walks could be something that is celebrated depending on where the person is starting. Now, obviously that's not where we want to end. Um, but in the beginning, building confidence for individuals that have cited confidence as the reason why they're not active is going to be incredibly important. Um, and, you know, one other thing to consider here is that if you are find yourself in a situation and you've tried to, you know, get people more active, get fire, your, your peers more fit. And so you've instituted some type of competition. Competition in some cases uh, could I actually further marginalize um, the department because those who lack self-confidence could feel you know, even worse about them, themselves. And so just you know, being cautious about the approaches that are taken um, because it could have the opposite effect of what you're trying to do. And last one here that I'll share is, you know, so for a, a situation where firefighters are not active because there's limited structure or a lack of routine in place. And so it's on a daily basis. There's just so much, you know, fluctuation in, in what I can do things or what I can do. So here it might be, okay, how can we as a department institute something that enables the behaviors that we're trying to change? And so are there ways to, um, you know, within the, the course of a, of a shift, um, can we make it easy to be active? Um, and so, you know, just a few tips to, to think about how do we change behaviors, you know, making it easy, making it obvious, making it attractive. Uh, these are things that we can explore over the course of a shift schedule um, to try and address this, uh, this barrier of limited structure. And you know, obviously some of the policies that are in place, um, you know, could be used to, or perhaps would need to be adopted or adapted to, to suit that pursuit. But this is again, gonna depend on the situation you find yourself in. One thing I, I think is important to highlight here is especially in the early stages when we're trying to change someone's behavior. Behavior, behavior change is hard. Um, but one of the big things that we should be focused on is consistency. And so the, if you can embed some type of consistency um, day to day, at least until the behavior has been established, that's gonna go a long way to helping people overcome the obstacles that they have. Especially if uh, like with this scenario here where lack of routine or limited structure is one of the primary reasons why they're not active. So emphasizing consistency is gonna go a long way. So again, um, you know, just thinking about, you know, what we do, what can we do, uh, the IFF and Fit to Thrive, you know, really trying to support all these different scenarios um, that you might find yourself in with different resources, with different tips, with different strategies. So you can actually, Know, address the, the needs you you have within your own department. And you're probably thinking, or at least some of you are probably thinking, well, you know, just given the diverse nature of, of uh, the population that we have, there's probably people with, you know, that, that lack structure, other people that lack you know, motivation, other people that lack, you know, the skills. And yeah, that's exactly right. That is the reality. And so I think that just further highlights that there is no one size fits all solution that is gonna work for every department or every individual. And so at least being able to consider um, the approach that is taken, you know, when you're, you're thinking of build, building out a program, just making sure that the solutions that you're coming up with do match the underlying 
reasons why certain behaviors are adopted. Um, and just to acknowledge that perhaps, you, you know, your members may need to plug in at different points of time um, to ultimately help more of the more of the population become more active. So with that, I am going to end and uh, we'll open up the floor for any questions or th that are there. Or Harrison, if you want to uh, chime in with any of the questions that have been posed throughout the talk. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Absolutely. Um, in the chat, if you scroll up maybe a little bit, Matt and Michael Westick both had pretty good questions, which I think might, uh, I think you might have some useful insight for them. Do you, do you mind uh, just reading out the questions? Just so Absolutely. Know, so Matt says, when it comes to being dog tired from shift work, isn't it better to rest versus work out overall? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a great question. Um, and I would say that sleep and rest and recovery is 100% is important. And so by no means am I suggesting that, you know, you need to be exercising or active every day. Um, or even, you know, it, it might depend on the type of activity that, that you're embedding um, or in, in your day. So if you find yourself completely exhausted after the end of a shift, um, perhaps before you decide to go to bed or before you're brushing your teeth or whatever, whatever it is, you do five minutes of like this, this, just this movement hygiene idea. And so perhaps you fit in a little bit of mobility. Um, just because if you're, you know, just completely exhausted, kind of worn down, that could help to facilitate further recovery. And so we're not suggesting that this needs to be a, you know, high intensity, high effort activity that's done. It's just looking at you, can we be consistent in committing to being active in some way? Um, again, it could, it could be as simple as something, you know, just going for a walk, perhaps, you know, when you, when you do get up from, from having sleep. Um, just a five minute little thing. So um, completely agree. Great question. Uh, there are in many cases, you know, prioritize rest recovery, but being active can help to facilitate that. Garrett. Hey, can I chime in? Okay. Yeah. Um, this, is, this, this is for the athletes out there. You know, that we, as coaches, we always preach, you know, when you're fatigued, when you're tired is when you really got to focus. That That's the fourth quarter. Everybody's got to be really focus, focus, focus. So on, on that same note, when you're fatigued and you're, and you're dead tired, as Dave mentioned, movement hygiene, maybe a five minutes just to reinforce uh, movement hygiene, how we move and, and good behavior, because if you're tired and exhausted, you'll revert to your worst common behavior, which may be bad movement. So uh, risk of injuries, all those things. Yeah, and, and the other thing I'll, you know, maybe last thing I'll say on that is that being active can be energizing. And so it can be very easy to get into a routine that you're always tired. Um, and so you know, how do you break out of that routine and just embed some little things um, you know, in the day to help with the recovery, to help rejuvenate you? And so, as I said, like it could be starting small. Um, and so if you are, are non-threatening with the, the activity that is embedded, after completing, you might actually feel better. Um, and so this, again, it depends on the context, depends on the individual, but it's very easy to get into a routine that I'm always tired when I get home because I haven't slept, you know, had, you know, a ton of calls. Uh, I just want to, just want to sit and relax and it just becomes this perpetual thing that, you know, six months down the road, you're like, oh man, I've been tired every day and I haven't been active in six months. Um, and so it's, you know, sometimes it's just making that small little step to start and it could help to reverse you know, a lot of the, the fatigue and, and soreness that you might be feeling. Um, Michael had asked a question earlier, but Sam has reiterated it in the Q and A. How do you approach guys who don't work out on shift and blame the possible disruption of a call for why they don't? That's, that's complete reality. So I think that there's, there's a lot of things that or a lot of reasons why people may not want to work out on shift. And I don't know if we, I don't know if the right approach is to say, well, too, too bad. You, know, you need to work out anyways. Um, because I think that 
as long as people are active, then I think it's, uh, from my perspective, well, anyways, I think it's okay. Now, if in your department, part of the reason, if you're thinking about, you know, more broadly and, and just the influence on anybody, everybody, that part of what you're trying to do is change the culture. And so there is this, you know, group idea around being active um, or, or just, you know, being in the same vicinity when everybody's active. I think that's a different, different approach or a different strategy um, or would require a different strategy because there are certain things you can do to promote you know, kind of group cohesion or team cohesion. So everybody feels supported by each other, but that doesn't mean that everybody has to do the same workout per se. Um, you know, if everybody's in the same vicinity and just kind of doing something, but it's framed as a way to build, you know, team cohesion rather than this is your opportunity to exercise and, and, you know, become more fit or become more active, then that might change the perspective of the individual who doesn't want to exercise on duty. Um, again, because there are, yeah, th th there's so many different situations here. Um, perhaps they don't like what's typically done by those who are exercise on duty. Perhaps they don't want to, you know, have to, you know, get sweaty and then have to, to shower again. Perhaps they feel a little insecure about actually being active in front of their peers. So digging in a little deeper into why they may not want to do that can provide further insight into what could be done to, to help address it. And then in the chat again from Michael, uh, how do we address when you have more than one of those scenarios within your group? Do you do one-on-one -on -one with each addressing them individual or do you group them together? Sorry, if we're talking about the different scenarios that- um, I believe those that. case studies at the end. I think the reality will be that you, you will run into situations that have multiple scenarios, if not all, all six and, and perhaps others. And so I think in reality, when we're putting something together, it's just having options in place. And so not being so strict that everybody has to do the same thing and everybody has to follow the same plan. Um, so when you have multiple options in place that can accommodate the different obstacles, barriers that people right have or the different reasons why they're not active, then I think you stand more of a chance to, to see success. Um, and I think this is also where you can really leverage some of those support pieces. You know, so the, the idea of, of using champions, um, using people of influence, you know, leveraging peer fitness trainers or, or wellness and fitness ambassadors to be advocates for the broader mission of, you know, getting everyone active. Um, highlighting the importance of, of culture and, you know, kind of coming together. Um, so it's, you know, how can you structure the support system in place? So everybody sees that we're, we're, we're doing the best that we can trying to accommodate the diversity that exists. And this is not a mandated one size fits all solution that everybody has to plug into. Um, and so that alone, I think will go a long way to helping the, the members see that you know there is something in here for them. And then Brian in the Q and A, um, his department is planning a weekly training cycle that will be scenario based fitness activities. We have a mix of very fit individuals and some very sedentary ones. Ideas on how we generate something to benefit all people involved and not cater to only one extreme. That's a great question. Um, I think this is probably going to be something where the, the actual scenarios that are, are built out um, will probably have to um, you know, be considered a lot. So, you know, would, like, are, they, are they perceived as fitness or exercise activities? Are they perceived as, as more firefighting skills or drills? Um, given that everybody's a firefighter, then perhaps they are more likely to um, I guess be less threatened if, um, if it looks like a, a job task and an exercise. Um, and then the other thing, I guess it depends on what your, uh, if there are outcomes or metrics by which you're gauging some type of success. And so if it is turned into a competition right away, that's going to have the, the more sedentary people shy away. And so if it is viewed as more of a, 
you know, involvement participation piece where there is no um, emphasis on, you know, time to completion or, uh, you know, things like that, it, it could help to address the diversity amongst the group. Um, and then the other thing, you know, I guess, you know, without knowing specifics about what the, these sessions look like, you know, are there opportunities to embed structure whereby people are kind of going through it um, in a manner that suits their current abilities? And so there is an opportunity for those who are, you know, the hard chargers, the, the very fit individuals to, you know, show, express, you know, what they can do. But there, there's also an opportunity for others to kind of go through at their own pace um, based on, on their current abilities, or at least their perceived abilities. Another one from Mallory in the Q&A. Um, our department is very new on fitness while on shift. We have recently had a new progressive chief that wants us to work out while on shift. What do you suggest I might send out to our membership to help motivate those uh, who may have never worked out well on shift before? Uh, this is, it's an awesome question. It's definitely something that um, you know, lots of departments are experiencing. The, the biggest thing for me here is, and you know, Garrett and Dave, and you guys can comment as well, but it's diverse options. Um, so not having the same thing for everyone. And so if, if you, if you see that, you know, the department is providing opportunity for me to, you know, improve myself, become more active, healthier, or whatever, it's are there options being provided that actually suit my interests, that suit my current abilities? Um, if it is this, you know, we're plugging into, you know, say, say I have, you know, some people that are involved in the department that are active on a regular basis, you know, fit individuals, my perception of right away is I don't want to do what they do. I don't want to be doing this, you know, high intensity CrossFit program, um, but I'm, I'm not active. And so making sure that there are options for that other part of the population to plug into that, uh, you know, are more inviting or enticing and making sure that if you have champions of some sort, or, you know, PFTs or, or otherwise just the people of influence, that some of the messaging that goes out, that it's this, the purpose here is to get more people active. Um, you know, if it looks like what the fit people do, you're going to lose, you know, the other half right away. And so despite having good intentions, it could have the opposite effect. So, you know, really trying to use or, or leverage the ambassadors that you have, the, the, the champions to promote the, the, the activity and the less threatening options for, for that continued as well. We've just got one more, if we have time, mm -hmm. Dave, sure. um, from Kevin in the chat. Uh, we have a standard on shift that you need to work at at least 30 minutes and they give us plenty of opportunities to do so. But how can I motivate firefighters to do more than the bare minimum, as in walk on the treadmill as slow as it goes for 30 minutes? So that's a great question too. So I think in this case, um, it really is looking at or trying to understand the motives of those individuals. Um, so if, if we're assuming that walking on the treadmill for 30 minutes is not good enough, then it's, you know, how can we incentivize that individual um, or shift their, their perspective, shift their attitude to highlight why doing this other piece is actually going to provide benefit. Um, and so in those cases, you know, what I would do is, you know, really try and understand, you know, what is important to those individuals um, so that, you know, when we talk about education and, and making sure it can, uh, you know, provide personal value, how can I provide personal value to that individual? You know, what are some of the, or the, those group of individuals, what are some of the other perhaps, you know, less threatening activities that I can give them as options to address the needs they actually have? You know, one of the things that we've, we've done in the past with departments um, is, uh, I guess, integrating like a mobility piece because, you know, everyone needs mobility. And, you know, as, you know, for firefighters in particular, you know, you get worn down, kind of broken down over time, 
you lose access to a lot of the mobility that you once had. And that has a direct influence on quality of life uh, in a variety of ways. And so if in addition to walking, it's like, hey, here's like a little five minute little mobility circuit you could either do before or afterwards. And it's like, oh, well, that wasn't so bad. Um, you know, maybe their their reason to not want to do something else because they thought that whatever else you were going to give them was going to you know, be extremely hard, um, you know, make them more sore. And so if you start with a non-threatening mobility piece, then that could get them doing something else that actually provides direct value to their life. And once they have engaged in that a little bit to see that this actually does make me feel a lot better. Um, maybe they're more inclined than to say, okay, what else you got? And, you know, taking a, you know, a longer term approach to this, you know, slowly but surely you start introducing things that are providing direct value to them that are not perceived as threatening, but only beneficial. And I think that is all of them. Great. Those are some really good questions. And, you know, just to, again, highlight, I think, you know, every one of those questions is something that we've, we've definitely heard in the past. And so you are not alone. Um, you know, every department is going to have, you know, their things going on, but, but you know, the, the questions you have are also questions that, you know, several other departments will also have. And so part of what we're doing with, with Fit to Thrive and, you know, we continue to, to hope to do is, is share some of these, you know, commonly asked questions, share kind of some of the scenarios you guys see what other groups have done. So from a modeling approach, um, you know, we, we hope to provide resources for you so you can see what other groups are doing to help overcome some of the obstacles that, um, that you might currently have or address some of the, the concerns and the constraints um, with the, the goal of, of, you know, everybody getting more firefighters active. <laughs>